is about the difference uh, between investing and trading. Um, people often talk about the two uh, and sort of mix up the two um, different types of, uh, uh, let's say, economic activity um, with sort of a lot of indifference, whereas the, um, the, there are a lot of differences between investing and trading, and we're going to go through them uh, one by one and, and go to go into a bit of detail in each one. Um, first, we're going to have a look at uh, the definitions, the main definitions that uh, regard investing and trading, uh, then the financial goals, uh, the risk reward ratio, uh, the approaches, uh, the approaches in analysis, which uh, also changes considerably, um, the asset selection, the decision making process, uh, we'll touch a bit of risk management lightly. I'll, I'll give a couple of examples and then, and then we'll close with the uh, pros and cons of these two activities. All right, in investing. Uh, what defines investing? Um, above all, that it's long term. And uh, assets can go beyond uh, the typical assets that traders use, uh, such as stocks and bonds. Uh, as it can mean touch uh, things like uh, real estate or other physical assets like precious, precious metals, for example. Uh, whereas trading is short term, uh, literally short term meaning from a few minutes uh, to a few hours or a day or two. And when you compare that to investing, um, when I say investing is long term, uh, usually an investor is going to uh, buy an asset and hold it for at least a year or two or five or 10 or 20, depending on uh, on his goals. So clearly these two uh, aspects are very defining for investing and trading. And then uh, in terms of assets, the trader will only consider liquid assets. And by liquid assets, I mean assets are it, that are easy to enter into a trade and easy to exit. Uh, real estate, for example, is not easy to enter and exit and, uh, in the sense that it can take many weeks to to enter a real estate investment and it can take months to exit. Um, so we'll look at the next uh, slide, the, the financial goals. And here, of course, the financial goals differ considerably. Uh, Investor is... Uh, um, more geared to wealth accumulation. Um, so his investing activities uh, regard uh, long-term uh, aims. So his, his um, investment horizon being years, uh, five, 10 or 20 years into the future. So he's more uh, concerned about wealth accumulation. Uh, whereas the trader is uh, looking for a short-term profit and look, looking to generate income um, almost on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, the goal of the, the investing, this type of investing is to uh, is, is because of the different type of goals. And an investor is looking perhaps um, to uh, accumulate wealth for his retirement uh, or to buy a house, uh, to make a down payment for a house in the future or to um, pay for his children's uh, education when the time comes. Whereas a, a trader is looking for income generation, uh, basically wants to make money that he will be able to use uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So after a month of trading, the traders made money, the most likely option is to take that money out of the account uh, and to use it, maybe in daily activities or maybe even to invest it in, in a long-term investment. Um, so you see the difference here is um, the investor is looking for asset growth and he'll do that uh, principally by holding a diversified um, portfolio of assets. Um, so it's very unwise for an investor to put uh, all his capital into say stocks only or real estate only or bonds only. Um, the best practice is to uh, diversify among uh, many, many, many different assets. 
you know, diversify among different stocks, uh, bonds, precious metals, and, and perhaps real estate. Was the the trader uh, because of his financial goals being a uh, quick gains. Um, he also has uh, the con the concept of uh, uh, of staying in the trade for a very very short time. Um, <clears throat> let's look at the next slide. And the risk and reward uh, ratios. Um, as a trader, your 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 short your short term objective is to uh, enter a trade risking let's say hundred dollars uh, to try and make two hundred dollars, and and it's a very short term um, uh, position, and you're looking for a high reward potential. And this is clearly evident from uh, the risk reward ratio. If you're risking hundred dollars in a trade and you're looking to make two hundred. Uh, you've got a risk reward ratio of two to one or one to two. So you're looking to make twice the money you're going to risk on the train. Uh, whereas an investor is uh, typically carries lower risk, principally because he is trading with the money uh, that person has on his account. Whereas a trader is going to use uh, leverage. And I know I've mentioned this uh, in previous um, classes. Just to go through it again, leverage is um, capacity to trade in a much larger amount than the amount of capital you have on your trading account. But let's say you have ten thousand dollars on your trading account, you could trade for a uh, hundred thousand. That would mean you're using a leverage of ten to one. So with ten to one leverage, you have ten thousand dollars on your account, and you can open a trade. Uh, for all a hundred thousand dollars, and this allows the the trader to take advantage of very short term uh, movements and very small fluctuations in price, because a uh, fluctuation in price of one percent, and it's multiplied with your leverage by ten, it is going to mean uh, uh, a difference in your capital of ten percent. Uh, so it becomes much much more interesting for a trader to use leverage and of course much more dangerous because the same way you can make that money you can lose it so the the risk reward uh, ratio can also allows uh, traders to be more flexible um, uh, the main reason being that, that a trader can uh, sell uh, assets as well as buy them uh, Gino, Gino Delacio, yeah. there's there's a question. What do you yeah. mean by liquid assets? By well, liquid assets is in this term, uh, liquidity in the in the world of investments or financial markets. Uh, when we talk about liquidity, we're talking about assets that have a very very large market, and this means that there there is always a price uh, where somebody wants to buy this asset, and there's always a price where somebody wants to sell this asset. So you as a trader. You can look at the prices that are already out there in the market, and you can see that somebody wants to buy the price, uh, wants to buy the asset, let's say for a hundred dollars. Uh, somebody else wants to sell it for a hundred and one dollars. So now you have the opportunity to sell. You want to sell the asset at a hundred or buy it at a hundred and one. Uh, if the prices are always there for throughout the day, then that's considered a, um, a very liquid market because the prices are always there. You just have to click on the screen and enter the trade. There's other markets, um, such as real estate, for example. Uh, the asset is there. It's a physical asset. And the price is sort of subjective. And it's subjective because it depends on the owner. And it depends on uh, how many potential buyers he has. It depends if the economy in the country is going very well. Um, so, so that price of that asset it's not very liquid. Uh, to begin with, there's only one house of that uh, type at that uh, number in that particular row. So, then there aren't hundreds of buyers and hundreds of sellers of that asset, right? There's going to be one seller, and presumably at some point, somebody will come and buy it. That doesn't create a, a, a liquid market. A liquid market is created by hundreds of buyers and hundreds of sellers 
uh, constantly in, in the market every day, looking to buy and sell the, the, specific, the specific asset. I'm not sure if that, um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I think you take it with you that it's it's those large markets where there's a lot of a lot of movement quickly of people buying and selling. So there's always a price so you can get in and out of the market fast. That's right. That's right. So the trader is looking for liquidity because it allows them to enter the position and to exit the position very quickly. Um, so that, that, that's the flexibility that traders have, that they can sell and that they can also buy. Whereas um, the risk reward re uh, ratio for an investor is very different because he's expecting steady growth over a very, very long period of time. And an investor is not concerned with uh, short or let's say small or temporary fluctuations in uh, the price of an asset. So if the stock market goes down 5% or 10%, that's not really a concern. Uh, obviously no one likes seeing their, their uh, portfolio go down in value, but it's not a particular concern because the, the investor is holding that asset for maybe five years, 10 years or 20, and there's plenty of time for the price to go back up again and, and for the investment to give uh, a decent return. So this comes to the third point, uh, investors looking for long-term rewards. And um, uh, this is also, um, uh, let's say, increased by, by compounding. And compounding means that the return you earn on, on an asset or an investment, you put back into the investment. And, and now the investment, uh, the amount you have in that investment has grown. And the next return will be magnified because you put more money into that investment. Uh, whereas the uh, trader is looking for an active income. Successful trader, of course, uh, can generate um, an active income, uh, an income that he can use daily or withdraw from his account every month. Whereas uh, the investor is looking for a long term growth and He'll see his rewards or withdraw his rewards, let's say, uh, very far away into the future. Uh, another aspect that uh, makes a big difference is uh, the type of return. Uh, investor is usually uh, going to have a moderate return, relatively speaking, to a successful trader, um, because perhaps uh, an investor is looking for a return of 10 or 20% per year. Whereas the, because of the high risk, um, high risk nature of trading, um, a successful trader can turn his uh, initial capital uh, and double it in a year. So, so we have a, a trader who's successful may may be successful enough to double his capital in in the course of a year. Uh, whereas that very very extremely rarely happens with an investor. The investor is most likely to get a return of 10 or 20 or um, is extremely lucky 30% in one year, but it's very difficult that it, that it can go above, above that type of return, but it also has less risk. Um, the investor is very unlikely going to burn all his capital in his investment. He has a very diversified portfolio. It's very unlikely to happen. Whereas a trader, it's uh, very possible that uh, at some point he loses all his money on his on his uh, or her trading account. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, the approaches in uh, analysis. The um, the the investor is uh, basically concerned with uh, fundamental analysis, uh, the long term trend of the asset and creating a diversified portfolio. Now, the, the fundamental ana analysis is um, basically a way to value the intrinsic uh, worth of a, uh, an asset based on things like com uh, company performance or financial statements, and uh, in, in a way to, uh, um, let's say, to uh, assess the long-term health and growth potential. And uh, th this type of analysis 
um, matches the, the interest of the investor because he's looking at long-term trends. He's not looking for uh, short-term price fluctuations. He's looking to see uh, which which assets uh, will have a decent return over a long period of time. And also within this aspect of fundamental analysis, uh, the aim of the investors to create a diversified um, portfolio of assets. Uh, this helps spread the risk uh, of the portfolio. Um, for example, if uh, somebody decides to invest all their money in stocks, they are extremely exposed to a stock market shock or a stock market crisis. But if they put some some of the, the money in stocks and they put some of it in precious metals and they put some of it in real estate and some of it in bonds, or well, if there is a, a the stock market uh, crisis, obviously they'll be less effective because there's only a portion of their portfolio in stocks and the rest of it is spread across uh, various assets. So the, the concept of uh, diversifying a portfolio helps to minimize uh, risk. Whereas from the trader's point of view, he's only concerned about price fluctuations and therefore is going to look at technical analysis, which is the specialty of uh, defining patterns and indicators um, the, or the study of patterns and uh, price movement of, of the market. So the, the technical analysis will lead uh, the trader to identify possible trade, uh, whether it's buying or selling, and put on that trade uh, wait a short time, a uh, very short amount, amount of time, and then exit the trade for a loss or profit. Um, so these are all short-term indicators, and fundamental analysis doesn't come into the picture very much. Although it may, it may on occasion, uh, for example, in the, in the data release, there may be uh, an eco economic data release like uh, um, employment data or inflation data. These tend to affect the markets a lot. Uh, so you might you might be using fundamental analysis, strictly speaking, for that short period of time, because again, he's only interested in uh, the fluctuate price fluctuations over short periods of time, from a few minutes to a few hours to the most one day. And um, uh, another difference in the in the approach is that. Um, as we mentioned before, an investor will be looking to, uh, to diversify with as many assets as possible, whereas a trader will look to specify uh, or concentrate in a specific uh, market. Uh, usually, um, traders look at stocks, or they look at forex, or they look at uh, precious metals through precious metals that are traded through uh, futures contracts, and. Um, uh, it's very it's very rare that a stock trader will will also trade forex because they they're not specialized. It's very hard to specialize in two extremely different markets. And once they've chosen the market, uh, usually these traders, if they choose stocks or they choose forex, um, they'll they'll choose within that market a few assets to trade on. For example, a forex trader will re very rarely trade more than three or four uh, currency pairs. Is it becomes very hard to to stay on top of uh, more than four or five markets and get to know um, these markets uh, uh, um, in a very very well and very very expert way. Okay, next slide. All right, so this leads us to the asset selection. So the asset selection for a trader, um, a lot of traders would simply choose one asset. So sometimes they just trade a, a stock index. Uh, others trade uh, maybe just one stock, one large company that's trading on a public exchange. Uh, or they might choose um, just one uh, currency pair. And a lot of traders stick to one, one market. Others would prefer to branch out. We will probably not choose more than two or three different um, assets, two or three different currency pairs, or you know, two or three, four stocks. 
and concentrate on the, on those. Because a diversified portfolio can, for an investor means that he has to look at many different types of investments. Um, for example, in the stock, uh, in the world of stocks, you might look at uh, industrial stocks, you might look at technology stocks, you might look at financial companies, you might look at uh, um, uh, medical and uh, health companies and diversify his stock portfolio in that way. And then for further diversification, he'll also look at bonds. So we'll look at government bonds, we'll look at corporate bonds, and then further perhaps look at real estate or look at precious metals and diversify again you know, with, with more assets. And um, so these, these long-term assets for, uh, for an investor tend to be established companies because they give, uh, they're more reliable, let's say. Uh, a very well-established company that's been around for a decade or two and has had consistently uh, positive returns is more likely to continue uh, to to create those positive returns and generate a profit year after year. And the same goes for bonds. Uh, investors are more likely to look at uh, government bonds because they are more reliable or corporate bonds or again, very well-established companies. Uh, the same goes to for real estate properties. Uh, real estate properties tend to be uh, properties that are in a large town uh, and more likely to have a market a buyer, let's say, when the time comes to sell those assets. Um, whereas the uh, short term, the short term aspect of, of trading, um, as we mentioned earlier, the trading is a liquid market. So these tend to be stocks, forex, uh, commodities with futures contracts, and more recently, cryptocurrencies. Next slide. So the decision making process. So the, the decision making process is uh, is also another aspect where um, investors uh, have a completely different uh, uh, view. As we as we mentioned uh, earlier, the investor will look at fundamental analysis. Uh, above every, uh, everything else, the uh, price fluctuation is not of uh, any particular concern. Even if the company that the investor is considering dropped 5% yesterday, it's not really uh, a very big concern because he's going to look at um, the, the books of the company. And there are three, uh, three things he'll be looking at, which is the uh, financial statement, and um, and um, the company performance and and so on. Whereas the uh, the trader will be looking at uh, price fluctuations. He, he will be studying the charts, studying to see if there are any patterns that have a good uh, likelihood of repetition. And certain patterns that appear on the chart uh, typically indicate the next move. And uh, traders looking out for um, those patterns uh, together with technical indicators and together with uh, other things like uh, support and resistance. And this is necessary because the, the traders has uh, a very short term uh, horizon for, for trading. This position will be open for a very short period of, period of time. So the price fluctuation uh, can be very small, but thanks to leverage, uh, you know, a lot of money can be made on that trade, or it can be lost also, of course. Um, but the, re the, re the reward is very high uh, in, in getting the trade right, thanks to leverage. So they're only looking, the trader is only looking for very small price fluctuation. Whereas uh, the investor, because of the time horizon being long-term, uh, takes a more patient approach, and is considering the long-term uh, prospects for the asset in question. And then it's looking to see how well the company can do in the next five to 10 years, rather than uh, five minutes to an hour. Um, and, and again, within the decision-making pro uh, process, um, 
the investor is always looking to diversify uh, his portfolio and always looking to uh, holding uh, a variety of assets uh, rather than focusing on just one specific market or asset. Whereas a trader will focus, uh, if not on a single asset, a single market. And um, yeah, like I mentioned before, it's very rare to see a trader who's trading stocks get up one morning and decide, oh, I'm going to start trading uh, Forex now. They're completely different markets, they work in completely different ways. And one has to be uh, an expert or specialist and specialize in uh, the market you're going to trade in. And okay, so your uh, risk management. But uh, the, the difference here is fundamentally leverage. A trader will be using a, a considerable amount of leverage because without leverage, the small fluctuations in price won't produce um, much of a, a gain or a loss. So it would take a, a, a very long time to create um, the astronomical returns that some traders can make when they're, when they're very uh, profitable. And um, so, um, so, so there's the use of leveraging in trading, you know, Sometimes it's very high, sometimes 100 to 1 leverage. And if you have a thousand dollars on your account, you could be trading for a hundred thousand dollars, which is, in my opinion, very extreme. But even uh, 10 to 1 leverage can generate uh, very good returns if you, if you manage to get it right. Uh, whereas on the investing side, there is no typically, there is no leverage. Um, the investor is going to use the capital he has on his account and buy the assets uh, with the money he has available. So if the investor has $10,000, he's simply going to buy two or 3,000 of uh, stocks, another two or 3,000 of uh, bonds, uh, a couple of thousand of precious metals, uh, uh, and then for real estate, for example, or he could buy a, a fund, and, fund and invest in real estate. And spread out his um, his uh, portfolio across uh, a variety of, uh, of assets or of markets, but without using leverage. This reduces uh, the risk considerably. It's very rare that uh, the stock market goes to zero, and it's very rare that precious metals will go to zero, or bonds go to zero, or so on. So, because you're only investing the money you have. Uh, the worst that can happen is you might be at a, a loss. You might lose ten percent one year, or you might lose twenty or thirty, but you're not, you're not going to burn your account. Uh, as a trader, uh, he starts with uh, let's say he starts with ten thousand dollars, but it's very possible that he burns his account because uh, in one trade he can make a thousand dollars or he could lose it. Um, so, so there there we see a, ma a main difference. In, uh, in risk management, and that is that a, a trader uh, has to manage risk in a completely different way to, to an investor. And this brings us to the uh, exit strategy, which for a trader is, uh, is fundamental and uh, involves uh, the stop loss. The stop loss means that the broker um, that executed your trade will automatically close your position uh, if the trade uh, loses. X amount of money, the amount of, the amount of money that you had established. So let's say you established that you don't want to lose more than $100 on one particular trade. You can give the broker a stop loss order. And if the trade goes against you by more than $100, it gets uh, closed automat automatically. That's part of the exit strategy to, to, to guarantee, not to guarantee, but to avoid that you lose more than you should on any given trade. Uh, in the same time, when you give the stop loss order, order you'll also give a, a profit target. And the profit target order will, will usually be higher than, will usually be a, more, a greater dollar amount than the stop loss. So perhaps you, you know, the trader will give a, a profit target of $200. And once the trade reaches that target, it, it's closed automatically for a profit. And the trade is exited, and the trader exits the market. So, so we see here that uh, this 
Uh, it's very different to, as we want to see now, to an investor. An investor is going to enter the market, uh, buy an asset, and hold it. And because he, ha he has a, a very long-term horizon, uh, price fluctuations are of no real concern. Uh, let's say after a year, the asset in question has gone up 10%. But it's not in his best interest to sell the asset to gain that 10% because he has an investment horizon of maybe 10 years. <clears throat> Excuse me, or 15 or 20. So it would be imprudent to sell after one year because yeah, the, assets, the asset price went out by 10%. It's a, it's a good uh, return. But if, um, if the asset continues to grow over the coming years, and uh, then you've lost out on that investment. So, so the investor doesn't have a, a precise exit strategy other than the time horizon uh, in which he's investing. So for example, is the exit strategy might be, okay, I sell my, my investment after 10 years because uh, in 10 years time, I will need this money for uh, whatever issue I, I, I need to spend it on. And he's not so uh, concerned with price fluctuations. Although it's true that some, some investors may, especially those that pick their own stocks, you know, if the stock has done particularly well for two or three years in a row, and they believe maybe uh, the, the stock price might come down over the next year, they, they, might, they might sell. Um, there's also another aspect that, um, uh, an investor who's diversifying the portfolio and wants to maintain the portfolio diversified. Uh, there's also another aspect which would make the, the investor sell assets that have gone up a lot. Uh, for example, an investor that has only two assets in his portfolio, let's say stocks and bonds, and um, and he has 50% uh, stocks and 50% bonds, and that's his diversified portfolio to make the same thing. Um, let's say the stock market has an incredible year and goes up 30% uh, over the course of one year. He now has a, a portfolio, portfolio that's not balanced anymore. Because what the investor wanted was 50% in bonds and 50% in stocks. But because the uh, portfolio has gone, uh, the stock market has gone up by 30%, he has uh, now a much higher percentage in, in value in stocks and he has in bonds, right? So he would, uh, this will automatically lead him to sell uh, some of his stocks so that he can rebalance the portfolio and go back to a ratio of 50% stocks, 50% bonds. Yeah, I don't know if that's clear, but that's probably something that needs to be discussed in more detail, but it's called rebalancing the portfolio. Many investment uh, companies do that. Many, many asset managers do it uh, to maintain their portfolio balance. And then this leads to selling when, when an asset rises and also leads to buying when the asset goes down. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so uh, some examples. All right, so, uh, and here we can see the clear, we can see clearly see, I believe, uh, the difference between um, trading and, and investing. Uh, for example, an investor who wants to uh, invest in stocks and identifies uh, Apple as a, a company with uh, a high growth potential and, uh, and very good uh, prospects for for future income for the company and generating profits. Uh, let's say the, the investor considers that Apple has very uh, uh, cutting edge uh, products, uh, has a very high market share. Uh, the financial statement is, uh, has been uh, very positive with uh, good gains over the previous years and, and so on. So, so uh, the investor decides to invest $10,000 of his portfolio in, in Apple shares. The shares cost $150. And what happens is that he simply buys 66 shares of Apple. And what's the objective here? The objective here is to, to hold those shares for a long-term gain. And uh, 
Um, when you hold stocks, there's the revaluation re of the stock price, and there's also the potential for a dividend. In the case I chose here, I believe Apple does not uh, pay dividends, I believe, but um, there are many companies that do pay a dividend, and that is also an important aspect for many stockholders. Um, many companies pay a quarterly dividend, so every three months the investors receive uh, de depending on the company, there are many companies uh, only pay a two or three percent dividend, but there are some companies that pay as high as six, seven, or eight percent a year in dividends. So we can see that um, uh, the holder of a company uh, of stocks that pay a dividend, a regular dividend, uh, is gaining also this extra income stream uh, throughout uh, his tenure. For throughout the period he holds the, the stocks. Uh, one thing I have to do, I do have to specify is that the company that regularly pays dividends, those stocks will go up in price more slowly than a company that does not pay dividends. And the reason for that is that the dividend, if it's not paid to the uh, stockholders, it has to be somewhere and it's in the and uh, it's being held by the company. So if the company is holding all the cash. Is holding all the profits and maintains those profits uh, within the company, then the value of that company increases, and therefore the shares of that company uh, increase and rise at a faster rate than the company that, that is paying dividends. Right? So, so this is also comes down to um, uh, the choice an uh, investor makes. Uh, some investors prefer uh, price revaluation uh, of the stocks. And they prefer not to receive any income stream while they're holding the stocks and they would rather have it all at the end when they sell the stocks. And other investors prefer a slower increase in the price of the stocks, but to receive some income uh, regularly as, um, as while they're holding the stocks. Yeah. So um, uh, the exit strategy for, for uh, for this investor. The exit strategy for this investor is uh, uh, one of two things. He, either the company's uh, fundamentals have uh, deteriorated so so badly, uh, so significantly that, that he sees himself forced to uh, sell the stock. Uh, let's say uh, Apple begins making terrible phones and uh, nobody, nobody's buying them anymore. Uh, clearly, <clears throat> At some point, it, will, it starts looking very bad, and perhaps the investor would rather sell for a loss than continue holding the company. But it looks like its uh, future is not so so bright anymore. And the other exit strategy is uh, when uh, the horizon, uh, the investment horizon, is met. If the investor buys these uh, sixty-six Apple stocks uh, today with an investment horizon of ten years. And everything goes well right? at the end of ten years. He will sell those um, those stocks, and hopefully made a, a, a good return. And obviously, the, it could be ten years, it could be fifteen, or it could be uh, a, a day in between. If something happens in the middle, or, and so on. Well, as a trader, if we look at a typical trading um, uh, position. Uh, let's say in the forex market, uh, say a trader wants to uh, uh, to trade the euro dollar, and uh, the trader believes that it will strengthen against the dollar, uh, and that means the euro dollar, the price of the euro dollar exchange rate will go up. And uh, the market is currently quoting uh, one euro uh, at the exchange for one point ten dollars. Um, let's say he also has um, uh, 10,000, no, I wrote 1,000 here, but um, that's also possible, he only has 1,000. Well, using leverage, you can uh, you can buy $100,000 worth of, um, of euro dollar, yeah, at 110. And his exit strategy, his exit strategy will depend on on, on the outcome or of the position. If it goes up good, if it goes down, then bad, he'll lose. So, to protect his losses, uh, the trader will place uh, a stop loss. Let's say he places that stop loss at 109.50. So the broker automatically 
executes um, the sale in euro dollar and closes the position of the trader, or the, the market goes up and the trader gives the broker a profit target at 10.50 or 1.1050, and the market goes up, it, it hits the profit target, and, and the trader executes the trade and sells uh, his position of euro dollars. And the trader has made $500. Um, that's uh, a lot of money in a very short time frame. Those 50 pips is a very, very small move in price. And it could do that in, in literally in a matter of a few minutes, uh, especially on a data, on an economic data release. If there's no economic data release. It could do that in a, in a matter of a, in a couple of hours, even you know, as the market drifts up and drifts down. So, so we see that um, the exit strategy for a trader <clears throat> Is extremely well defined uh, and based on numbers <clears throat> you know, either it hits the stop loss or it hits the profit target um, <clears throat> whereas the uh, investor is more subjective it could be at a uh, in, it could be objective in the sense it could be in 10 years time no matter what but it's more likely um, <clears throat> to be slightly more subjective because in 10 years time uh, a lot of things could have changed and the investor might decide that uh, he's going to reinvest or continue holding his current investments and, and not sell anything. But it's more subjective in nature, um, the exit strategy of, uh, of an investor. And let's look at um, let's look at some com common tools. Uh, for, uh, for an investor, especially in the uh, stock market, <clears throat> um, the most uh, common tools uh, an investor will look at is to to evaluate uh, what the price of a company should be, or to evaluate the company's uh, uh, value. He's going to use three um, statements from the company's books, the, the income statement, as to evaluate a company's uh, financial performance, um, and basically uh, the revenue and minus uh, the expenses to determine the profitability. Uh, revenue is very important because it, it, it means the company is successful at selling products or services. Um, but at the, end, at the end of the day, we want a company that's also profitable. So the, the expenses are also very important uh, to determine that the company is actually profitable and, and not losing money uh, every quarter. <clears throat> now, another part of the book is called the uh, balance sheet. And this is where the company declares its assets and its liabilities. Um, this is a very important important ratio, um, the asset liability ratio, um, because a company that has more debt, uh, more liabilities than assets is a company that has problems. Um, clearly, it's a company that has not mm, is not making enough money, or at some point didn't make enough money, and had to take on a lot of debt. Um, it has to reduce that ratio, obviously, to be considered a company that, that's not about to go bankrupt. Um, so, so clearly, um, if the kind of company has a very high debt to to equity ratio, uh, that's not a good thing. And um, it's also always very relative. Um, for example, there are some sectors like uh, um, the car industry, most of the car makers have a very, very high debt to asset ratio. Uh, usually that is, the total liabilities are around 70 to 85% of uh, assets for most of the big car makers. Uh, so that sounds like a lot, sounds like very risky, but apparently that's how they manage their business and, and it seems to be acceptable. Whereas in technology companies that usually, that ratio usually tends to be a lot lower. 
Uh, first of all, they haven't been around as long, probably haven't had uh, to go through many bad periods of, uh, of, of sales or economic stress. And therefore, they're the asset to debt ratio on, on the, um, in the technology sector, for, for example, is lower. <clears throat> And then the third uh, part of the book that investors look at is cash flow statement. And cash flow is important because uh, it, it's uh, this is a different type of liquidity to the liquidity I was talking to talking about before. Uh, this liquidity really, really does literally mean uh, the amount of money uh, a company has <clears throat> that it, that is free money in the sense that it doesn't need it right now to spend it on anything. Uh, cash flow is important, free cash flow is important because it's money the company has that it knows it's not going to need to spend at least for six months, a year, uh, and so on. So when it has that kind of money, if something goes wrong, it is also prepared to go through that bad period. Let's say there's a, an economic crisis, there's a downturn in the economy, there's a recession, if a company has a lot, a lot of uh, cash flow, it's what we call uh, a very long runway. <clears throat> so as it's more likely to survive a downturn in the economy or a recession <clears throat> if it's holding a lot of free cash. And then the other factors uh, <clears throat> the investor will look at are non-financial factors that are uh, called intrinsic, and that is more to do with the quality of the products. Uh, the quality of management, uh, things like uh, industry trends, uh, like is it an industry that's going out of fashion? Is it an industry that's facing legal uh, um, legal predicaments that might uh, uh, not favor it? Um, <clears throat> things that are particular, peculiar to the company and the industry. <clears throat> Whereas the, um, the trader, He's looking at things, as I mentioned before, that, that have to do with um, technical analysis. And these are chart patterns that identify potential trends and reversals. Uh, there are many chart patterns. Well, one of the most famous is the head and shoulders, uh, which is a uh, very typical uh, reversal uh, pattern. And um, then there are other, other indicators like the MACD, the RSI, and MACD is to indicate a trend, you know, let's say to indicate the ongoing trend, uh, bullish or bearish. And the RSI indicator is to in indicate when a market is overbought or oversold. Uh, sometimes markets rise very rapidly, very quickly, and the RSI can warn us that perhaps this, this is not the right moment to buy because it, it might come down sharply soon. Another thing, uh, Another aspect or another uh, tool the traders have is support and resistance level. A support level is a level where the market has gone down and bounced on that level a few times, at least twice, maybe three, and then gone back up. And then at the later, you know, later on in the future, it comes back down to that level again. The market will probably pause at that level. And, and there's an opportunity there, uh, the trader understands if the market goes back up from that point, it's probably it's possibly a good time to buy as it may, as it may be traced back up. And whereas if it breaks the support level, then there's a, a chance that the market will continue trending down as it's broken the major support level. And therefore the, the trader will probably try and sell the asset at that point. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there is a bit of uh, fundamental analysis uh, as well. Uh, and we, for traders also, occasionally when there's an economic data release, uh, especially non-farm payrolls in the United States. Non-farm payrolls is uh, employment data for the United States. And of course, the United States has the world's largest economy. Um, everybody in the financial markets is watching that data release because it affects foreign exchange and just about every currency is uh, quoted against the dollar. Uh, so it affects the, 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 the forest market. It affects the US stock market, which is the world's largest stock market. Uh, obviously, because 
uh, implement data determines if the economy is expanding or or, or, is, or retracting or shrinking. And um, it also affects bonds, it affects pretty much everything. So the whole financial markets are, are watching this data release. So a, day, so a trader will also uh, look at the release of uh, the employment numbers and determine if it was a good number or a bad number and, and take the, the appropriate action in the market uh, the trader is uh, involved in. Right, let's have a look at the pros and the cons. Right, the pros uh, for investing, um, I would probably say, um, I put it as number two, but I should have put it as number one, uh, lower stress. Um, I think investors have a lot less stress um, from holding their investments because they're not concerned with short-term market fluctuations. So if the stock market loses 3% one day, well, that's a lot for a trader. And you might lose the trader if he, would, he bought the stock market that day would have lost, may have lost a lot of money. But for a long-term investor, that's not really of any concern uh, because his investment horizon is so far away there's plenty of time for, for the stock market to catch up again and go higher. Um, there are other two pros of the long-term wealth growth. So the investor is holding his investments so that they appreciate over time, they reevaluate over time, and they help for many things. Uh, it could be for retirement planning, maybe to buy a house in the future, or make a down payment to buy a house in the future. And there's also in many countries tax benefits uh, when you invest in, um, in the stock market or, or bond market uh, through the appropriate funds. Uh, usually, some type of retirement fund, you get a you get a tax benefit. Now, the cons cons for um, uh, investors are the slower returns because typically investment returns are much uh, lower than su successful trading returns. Uh, limited layer liquidity of some assets, for example, if you if you bought a an apartment or you, or you bought uh, precious metals and you're holding them in your, in your safe, uh, obviously they're not so easy to sell quickly and, and just uh, cash in on your investment. Uh, and then uh, there's always the, the market risk that investors are exposed to in, in times of a crisis. And uh, obviously if there's a crisis, then the market the investor is holding his investment and the market keeps going down, keeps going down, and eventually finds that he's lost 60%. But you still have your investment. So you, well, what's necessary there is, is to hold out and, and wait for the future uh, for the market to, to regain its previous um, highs. And uh, the trading pros. Well, here, uh, probably the most... Uh, <clears throat> Important is the, the potential, I have to stress the potential for short-term profit. As uh, traders only uh, profit uh, from uh, very small price fluctuations, they can potentially seize uh, very high gains over very short periods of time. And uh, they also have flexibility. They have flexibility that an investor doesn't have because uh, a trader can sell an asset and gain from the market going down, as well as the market going up, really, in which case we buy. So it has much more flexibility and is not so concerned uh, of the growth of an, uh, an asset's price and more concerned about the fluctuation in price. And the further one is the active income that uh, a successful trader can create. Because if, if every month uh, as, as trader is successful and he's created some uh, some cash, he's generated an income, and he can withdraw that cash from his trading account uh, to use in his daily life or to put towards uh, uh, to put towards some investing. And the cons is very high risk, <clears throat> and that can't be stressed enough. Because I, I think around uh, it's a statistic that's very well known: around eighty percent of uh, retail traders lose their money. Uh, simply put, any percent. Uh, so it's very, very, very high risk. It's very hard to get it right. It's very hard to be consistent and to continuously get it right. 
And then there are uh, emotional stress. Emotional stress is something that uh, I think it's probably why most traders lose money because obviously it's very hard to see uh, how uh, you open a trade and it and loses $200 for you. Uh, I think that must pretty much stress anyone. And then it's also time intensive. Uh, trading demands a lot of time, not just to trade, but also to learn. To learn all the ins and outs, to specialize and to be specialized in the market, to be specialized in a specific asset, um, to learn the technical analysis, to learn uh, the basics of the fundamental analysis um, and when it's required. So we, we I think we've uh, pretty much established all the, the main differences um, that there are between uh, investing and trading. And I guess if there are any questions now, I don't have the chat open. I, I wasn't looking, so. so. Um, if you you can raise your hands if you have a question. Uh, so Here we go, Doctor Kanbiro. Let's go with your question. Hello, hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, class. Do you thank hear you. Uh, hearing my sound, please? Yeah, I can hello. Hear you. Yes, hello. we can hello, hello, hear hello. you. Yeah, we I can, can hear you. you. Thank you, Professor Lambert and other participants. I love you. Uh, the presenter and all, all the IO uh, community. I, this uh, session, I wanted to know the uh, you're frozen. Just, I want to ask the presenter to know what is the uh, basic correlation or the relationship between the liquidity and uh, the profitability or the fair performance of any country, any company. The liquid, the, the relationship. Thank between, you. This is my question. The relationship between liquidity and profitability. Yeah, yeah, or firm performance in general. I'm not, I'm not sure of the question. The the liquidity and profitability of uh, of what of the market of a company. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The relationship between liquidity and profitability. Yeah, but of a company or of a, a particular. Of a given of a single company. A single company, right? So. Oh, so you, thank you for you, understanding. So usually a company that has a high amount of liquidity, which is what I mentioned before, uh, often called free cash flow. Uh, if they have a high amount of liquidity, it usually means they are also very profitable. But more importantly, it's a measure of uh, the, the possibility or the capacity of a company to uh, go through a very bad, uh, let's say, recession or uh, let's say it hits a bump in the road, <clears throat> excuse me, and the sales falls, uh, sales fall a lot, and um, it, it means that the company has a better chance of survival if something uh, very adverse happens to the company. So uh, liquidity and profitability are related in the sense that uh, a company with a lot of liquidity is always also profitable but it's more important to help us understand if the company can survive uh, a very bad period or a very bad uh, patch okay uh, uh i want to be clear uh, as your suggestions to your suggestions if company accumulates more money on hands 
we know cash has cash is is a less liquid is a less profitable asset in of the firm. If a company accumulates more money in the, uh, on hand, how it could be how the company could be the profitable? So, so I didn't understand the question. Do you understand my question? No, sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, as far as I know, and mm -hmm. uh, in my practice, mm -hmm. high profitability has a negative relation with it. I might know high high liquidity has negative relation with profitability. Liquidity means holding more cash on hand, yes, or uh, holding more liquidity, uh, more short term assets in hand, yes. Yeah. The firm. Yeah, yeah. So if a company holds more assets on hand, how company can be profitable? If company cannot invest, it is cash. It is uh, short term assets, other alternative short term as short term investments. How the company could be profitable? Yeah, 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 I see. But the the thing is that for the company to gain liquidity, it has to make profits. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Then obviously, if it keeps all the liquidity and it never makes any new investments, then there could be a problem, and eventually the profitability will fall because the company is not making any more uh, new investments. But to begin with, to begin with, the, the liquidity happens or the company uh, achieves a high level of liquidity thanks mm. to uh, a high profitability. And then, okay. of course, like okay. you say, if, if the company doesn't make any investments, eventually something bad will happen and it will it will stop making profits. Yeah. Okay. I understood your uh, explanation. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kanbiro. Uh, let's go to the next question. Tan Tengonmo. Tendongum. Tendonmo. Can you thank can you. you? Can you hear me please? Yes, yes. hi. Tendongmo. Hi. Thank you. I am Tendomo Franklin talking from Cameroon. Hi. Uh, th thank you for the brilliant presentation. Thank you. But I wish I wish you know um, when you were making your, your presentations or maybe the, the studies, did you take in cognizance the relation, the difference between developed and developing countries? Uh, because uh, because uh, there is uh, this uh, economic variance that exists between Develop and developing countries, mm -hmm. and oh, did you take uh, cognizance of the fact that uh, most developing countries in Africa, for example, in Africa where we can where we are, there is this tendency of uh, of uh, maybe investors invest Africans investing out of Africa. Mm. I don't know whether this you on doing your study you really took cognizance of that. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I didn't uh, make any um, re reference to uh, developed or uh, developing countries because um, this is purely the definition of investing and trading. And these two uh, definitions are applicable in, in any, uh, in any uh, type of economy. Um, obviously, uh, a developing economy will have a less developed financial market and it will be harder to invest and it will be harder to do trading, perhaps. But the definitions remain the same for developing and developed countries. Yeah. I, I don't know that Tendoma doesn't seem very happy about the answer. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah thank you for thank I, you for permitting me come. Yeah, um, I I don't I don't know. I've listened to you, but uh, I still have a little worry mm -hmm. because after li listening to the brilliant presentation, actually, um, it does 
it ties very little with the developing countries. Mm -hmm. And I wish to ask a question. Is there anything we can do like adaptability from your presentation to really suit the developing countries? Well, no, from my presentation, not really, because my presentation is just about the definition of uh, investing and trading. Uh, and it doesn't go into the aspects uh, for developing or developed countries on how to trade or how to invest. Because each country has its peculiarities, each country has its laws about what you can trade, what you can't trade, uh, what you can invest in, what you can't invest in. Uh, every country has uh, a bunch of laws and it's very peculiar uh, what you can do or what you can't do. And um, this was just to to uh, make a, a clear definition between uh, the two different activities because I've done many classes now and all my classes are about, are about trading and uh, so far. And uh, uh, there's often a lot of discussion about investing and, and what we're really doing is talking about trading. Mm 